Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Luskery, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango, and uh, I've been sitting here all day for Contest University, but I did get up long enough to eat and change into my favorite field day shirt. So this is my favorite shirt of all, all the field days, 2009. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about field day and social distancing, and the title is Field Day and Social Distancing 2, the sequel, because we did this last year, Field Day 2020 and Social Distance, Distancing, the original film. Uh, my contact information, kzt at awrl.net, and my website. Uh, tonight's presentation is not 130 slides, but there is 130 slides in the full slideshow. And there's links in the slideshow that you might want to access. So tiny.cc slash FDSD, field day social distance, will get you access to all of the links that are in the presentation today and all of the slides in the full presentation, which have some more step-by-step -step things for contest logging and some other tools. Uh, disclaimer, all, ex all opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not represent sp sponsors of, the of this session, not speaking on behalf or representing any organization or group. All the rules and policies fulfilled there are exclusively the realm of the AWRL. The purpose of this slide shows to provide clubs that will not be doing a traditional field day or only doing a limited field day or doing a traditional field day with ideas to fit the situation at their particular club. So for, 2000, for 2021 field day, we have basically three options as a group. Um, your group can decide to do a typical group field day, uh, the traditional way, or you might not do a tr traditional field day and individual members may do their own individual field days at their location of their choosing. Or what's happening at a lot of clubs this year is they're doing a hybrid where they're doing a group field day for some of the members in a small operation, a little smaller than usual. And some of the members may still be doing their own uh, individual field days. Um, as far as all the rules and everything go on the AWRL website, uh, you can find all the information as far as the rules go. Phil Day is traditionally a group-based activity, and the pandemic has disrupted that group basing of the activity a little bit. Often, uh, Phil Day is, the, is a new ham's first exposure to HF operations. Also, things like setting up antennas and radio stations, um, HF uh, as opposed to F FM and simplex as opposed to repeater operation. And it may be their first opportunity to ever operate in a contest like style. Are you hearing a dog barking? Okay. Nope, it's on your end. It's on my end, but I, I, I don't think it's coming interfering. Um, so the first question, the field day conundrum, I call it, is it a contest or is it a test of emergency communication? Clubs and individuals have thoughts that run the gamut between the two, and if you ask enough hams, you'll get enough answers. Uh, none of them will probably be the same. But I like the one from Stan, K4SBZ. It is not a test of MCOM. It is a demonstration of MCOM. In other words, it is a PR event to demonstrate to the public what we can do, not only for MCOM, but also other activities of ham radio. So I think that's a good, uh, a good uh, middle ground opinion on contest versus non-contest. I will add a couple things I think that most of us can agree about field day. It's a great place for training new hams or those not experienced in operating HF. It's the first exposure most people get to putting up a tower, feeding a dipole, etc. It's also a test of a club's ability to plan and carry out a group project, whether they're functioning as a group or whether they're having individual operators work on their own, it's still a group project that requires club planning. The idea of improving operations each year by learning from both positive and negative experiences. And if your club is not doing this, this is probably one of the most important things they can do every year for field day, this year included. And that's just jot down what worked and what didn't work and try and uh, make it better next year. Being as flexible, being flexible as far as weather, band conditions, illness, equipment issues, test us every year. And this year, we still have the additional test of the pandemic added on that. Following a set of rules, even under adverse conditions. 
So here's some uh, illustrations of my local club doing field day. We look just like this, actually. Uh, field day 2021. Um, what I'm going to focus on now is some of the alternatives. If your club is going to do their same, their basic group activity that they've always done, I'll touch on that a little bit, but I'm going to talk about some alternatives or hybridization of that process. Field Day does provide a wide variety of ways to participate, and in the spirit of emergency preparation, one of the most important things we can always do at Field Day is remain flexible. So let's talk a little bit about some of the rules and some of the things that happen in field day and what you need to know about them. The first is you have to have a class. You have to choose a class uh, to play the game of field day. And the AWR field day actually has six different classes, A through F. And we're going to go through each of those and talk about what you as an individual or a club can do and which class you may want to operate under. In addition to the class A through F, there's also a number assigned, and that number designates the maximum number of simultaneously transmitted signals. So class A is a club or non-club group that is operating portable that has three or more, more persons. That's the key thing on group A, three or more persons operating portable. They set up specifically for field day. You can't use facilities installed for permanent station use or any other structure installed permanently for field day, for that matter. All club equipment has to be within a 1,000 foot circle. That includes the antennas. Class A is typically the class most clubs use at field day, and it is the most uh, common cl common uh, the thing that you'll hear during field day will be the A, but last year it was reduced drastically because of the pandemic, and I think it'll be reduced a little bit this year also. Class B is one or two person portable. So notice we have less than three. So one or two person portable at field day station set, operated, set up and operated by no more than two persons. Most other provisions are the same as class A. And it's less problematic for social distancing because if you're a one person operation, you're obviously socially distanced. One of the things that many hams have a misconception about class B is they think the B stands for battery. And that's not the case at all. Class B again, just means it's two, one or two people. Class B can use emergency power such as a generator, or they could choose to use a battery for the emergency power, or they could even use commercial power. As a matter of fact, when you see the results published in QST, there's actually 12 possible permutations of class B. Now remember the class exchange though is still only one B or two B, but you could have one B one, which means one operator operating one radio with emergency power, or one B two, two operators operating one radio with emergency power, or two B one, one operator operating two radios simultaneously with emergency power, that'll be me and so forth and so forth. But you notice we even have commercial listings. Class C is often sometimes misunderstood a little bit, but it basically means a mobile station in a vehicle that is capable of operating while in motion and normally operated in this manner. So this means that you don't, you can't take down or put up antennas when you stop or start. Uh, you have, you can't detach from uh, structures before you start or stop. So everything has to be able to be moved as it would be when you're operating. And it doesn't just mean cars. It could be a boat. It could be aeronautical. It could be bicycle mobile. The vehicle does not need to be moving, but must be fully capable of motion without any changes in antennas or the station setup. Class C is not impacted by social distancing as much as other classes. Uh, but sometimes you might run into cases where restrooms and food may not be uh, or limited availability. Without well-designed and installed antennas, mobile contacts can be difficult. So I have put together a number of links, including the great link from K0BG on uh, his everything about mobile operating for amateur radio operators and then also uh, some articles from AWRL and a few other places. So these are all links. You'll notice that the links are in a different font, and if you click on them, they will take you to whatever the resource is. So that's why you're going to need the whole slideshow to be able to get access these. Now, because the 
equipment has to be in the vehicle. If you put a number of vehicles in a parking lot, that doesn't add together. So you can't say that you're 5C if you have five vehicles parked because the st each station has to be in an individual vehicle. So it can't be part of another station uh, in another vehicle. So you can't combine them that way. Now, you can have 2C if you have two operations taking part in the same vehicle, and you can have 3C if you want. And there was a case a few years ago where someone had, I think it was a 6C on a boat, where they had six stations set up on a pontoon boat. And it, instead of Class C, if you pull a bunch of vehicles into an area, you can be a Class A or Class B station using portable power because your portable power from the the vehicle is perfectly fine and if you set up external antennas you'll actually have a bunch of better results propagation wise and the ability to make contacts so instead of class c if you pull all your vehicles into one 100 foot circle you can be a class a or b station so this is not a, a class c mobile operation because you can't drive when the antenna is lowered and you can't operate when the, so you can't drive when the antenna is up and you can't operate when the t antenna is down. So when you make that change, that means that that is not a Class C vehicle. That would be a Class A or B. Class D are home stations operating from a permanent station location uh, using commercial power. It can be a solo or family operation. And of course, that's not affected at all by social distancing. Before last year, though, the Class D stations were only allowed to receive points for contacts with Class A, B, C, E, and F stations. In other words, they couldn't contact other D stations for points. Last year at the last minute, the AWRL decided uh, to lift that with a special waiver for last year. And that waiver last year said the Class D stations were allowed to operate and receive points by contacting other D stations. For this year, 2021, they've extended that same uh, ruling and they've added one additional caveat to it. C both Class D and Class E stations are limited to 150 watts peak power this year. So to be able to contact other D stations, they also put this additional limitation of 150 watts peak power. So that is an addition from last year. And the link has details from the AWRL on that. Class E stations are the same as Class D, with the big exception is they're using emergency power instead of commercial power. So if you have a generator at home, you can operate from your home station. You're not a Class D any longer, you're a Class E. Or if you're using a battery-powered radio, you could be a Class E. Computers used to make contacts uh, need to be on the emergency power, but computers used for logging purposes only can be operated from commercial power. I'll talk a little bit more about emergency power for computers a little bit later. Class E may work all their field day stations for points, but are limited to 150 watts PEP for 2021. Class E is probably one of the best alternatives if you have emergency power. Class F is a special category for EOC centers, emergency operations centers, and a lot of those are closed currently, the same as they were last year. So you may not see here many F stations on the air. So last year when we were getting ready for field day, a lot of people said, well, that's okay. We'll have all of our club members operate from their home stations with our club call, and we'll lump it all together in one big score. This would be referred to as distributed joint station operations. And there were some contests last year that did have multi-operator distributed stations. But... AWRL said no distributed joint station operation for field day, and that is still the same case in 2021. So you can't run multiple stations, separate stations under one call sign. If you're using one call sign, everything has to be in that 100,000 foot circle. What they did say was, instead of dis, uh, disaggregated uh, joint operation will let you do aggregated club scores. So for 2021, as in 2020, aggregated club scores will be published, which will be the sum of all individual entries indicating a specific club. 
similar to the aggregated score totals used in the AWRL affiliated club competition in other contests. And again, there's a link for details on the AWRL website. And I want to just stop there and see if there's any questions about the aggregated versus distributed scores. Okay, I'll take questions when I'm done, but I just want to see if there's any questions on that specifically right now. Okay, no questions, so we'll continue. Before we go too far, though, I want to stress something, and that is safety first. One thing that the AWRL, most radio clubs stress at their field day site is safety first. One of the problems when you start having people operating on their own is they forget about the fact that the club spends a lot of time planning for a safe field day operation. And the other thing is when you're by yourself, sometimes you don't notice unsafe conditions because you don't have someone watching your back. So it's very important that you plan your uh, field day site using safety. And there's actually an Ada World safety checklist that's designed for club operations, but it's fine to use for your home operations also. So again, you can go to this and get a lot of good information on safety and operation. By its nature, social distancing is a compromise in many ways with untested equipment, tools and plans. Uh, your club may have uh, towers that they put up every year. They might have very carefully made sure that all the ropes that are used to support them and everything else is designed to work under those conditions. At home, you might just grab a scrap piece of rope and decide to put up something. So I think it's very important that you're very vi vigilant at home. And I'm going to make one suggestion. If you're operating field day on your own, don't climb to put a tower, put any antenna up. Once you start climbing, it's only possible trouble. So avoid climbing at all possibilities when you're operating on your own. And the second thing is this little sticker you always see on antennas and on mass pipes. It's very important, and it really means that you could die if you don't pay attention. So when you're putting up an antenna by yourself, if you're anywhere close to wires, stop and don't do it because it's just too dangerous if you strike a wire when you're putting up an antenna. Also, you need to be very careful with generators, especially gasoline power generators uh, when you're refueling. You can't refuel safely a gasoline generator while it's operating. Also, carbon monoxide fumes in enclosed spaces can kill. Even if it, you think you might have the garage door open, just putting that inside the garage, you can still get an accumulation of carbon monoxide, even with the door open, that could be deadly. So remember, carbon dioxide fumes are odorless, colorless, and can kill you. So that's the slide of death we just passed, and hopefully you'll remember that and not be a, a victim of field day. For class B, you could use your residence, but none of your permanently installed antennas, et cetera. But the AWRL has a very specific thing in their FAQ that says if you have convenient access across one's backyard to the home station, home facilities for your station, you're not keeping with the class or spirit of class A or B. So if you're doing it a couple thousand yards from your house and you're not going in the house all the time, it might be a different story. But the best thing is if you want to do Class B portable, pack your stuff up and go to some other park or some other location and operate. Visit a relative or something else that, so you're not at your station. If you're going to want to operate from home, operate as Class E and then you don't have to worry about the, the distinctions. So let's talk a little bit about emergency power options. For emergency power, there's really uh, four different categories. The first is a generator, either a standalone gasoline or natural gas. And even though it is attached with natural gas, that is still considered a emergency operation at home. So you're still class E. You can also use a motor vehicle based power system. So again, when we pulled all those uh, vans into a circle there and operated as class A, uh, we can use their power system and be on emergency power. Uh, for, you can also use solar power. You can also use batteries and batteries in inverter combos as long as you're charged before field day. If you're charged during field day, you must use an emergency power source to charge them. So if you need to recharge your batteries, you either use solar power or, a, or another type of emergency power to charge your batteries. To collect the maximum bonus points, use solar charge batteries. Other alternative power such as hand cranked, water wheel, etc. 
is way beyond the scope of today's discussion. And if you've ever tried operating a radio hand crank, you'll find out that it's a lot of work. That little bicycle generator, you better have a few people that are willing to pedal for long periods of time. But batteries work very well for emergency power. And that's what I've been using for years. Um, as far as generator power goes, I put together about a half a dozen reference materials on uh, selecting generators, using generators, uh, safety with generators, uh, inverter generators, et cetera, et cetera. So again, these are all links. Uh, notice the serif font and the little link indicator that you can click on for more information. As far as battery power, I did the same thing, put together over a dozen, half a dozen uh, information sources for batteries and uh, everything from building your own DIY 144 watt hour li lithium ferric phosphate to best battery go boxes, reviews, etc. So there's a bunch of information on batteries. Um, I'm using a battery similar to this. It's not this brand. It's a different brand, but uh, it's a battery that I ran my station off of for two days last year without without ever having to do anything other than uh, plug into it. And uh, I also have a battery backup like this for my computer. This battery backup uh, was under $75 and run my computer easily for the whole field day uh, weekend. Between the charge on the computer, that gives me about four or five hours. This will get me through the rest of the time um, with it. Another thing I've used in the past is I have one computer. It's, it's actually a... Um, it's, it's a laptop tablet combination. In other words, it's a tablet that's made into a laptop with a keyboard. And the nice thing is it runs off five volts. So I can use all those batteries that are, that are sold to use with cell phones. All those cheap cell phone banks work great. I have a couple of those that I can operate for a long period of time with my, radio, my computer that I use for FT8 uh, by utilizing one of those, uh, those phone chargers. With a lot of people operating in the field, operating on their own last year and this year, a lot of people were used to having the club take care of the antennas. There was always that person in the club that did all that. So I put together a handout on portable and temporary antennas. And it's basically uh, detailed information on the pros and cons of choosing different types of antennas. And then once you figure out what type of antenna you want, I put together a number of resources on each of the different antenna types, both DIY and in some com some cases commercial antennas. So if you're interested in half-wave resonant, non-resonant dipoles, resonant, non-resonant N-feds, uh, inverted Vs and slopers, verticals, beams. I gotta fix this page because it, it got a little bit mixed up there when I added another link this morning. That's one thing, whenever I do these presentations, I'm always adding you links as I found them. I found a great link on magnetic loops today. Uh, so there's a bunch of information here, even including VHF and UHF antennas. So again, that's available at tiny.cc slash port ant. Class B is very feasible if you have a location where you can be socially distanced. Uh, and you might use a go box or you might use a, v a radio in a class V, class C vehicle, but set up an external antenna. And here's what the the uh, fact says about the distance in your backyard. And I'm not going to read that to you. You're welcome to read it on the, F, on the FCC site or in my presentation. Um, go boxes are portable, transpo portable transportable radios and accessories that you can easily carry into the site. And there's really a couple different types of go boxes. Some people pack everything in cases and then set everything up when they get there. I prefer what I refer to as rapid deploy go boxes and I have a whole presentation on a whole website uh, page that has a lot of information on go boxes um, I call mine grab and go boxes or rapid deploy boxes if you have a kx3 this is an example of the go box that I use for field day it is a um, basically a tackle box that I put my KX3 in, I open the top, open the front, and it's ready to operate. I don't need to set anything up. Everything's pre-connected in there. The battery's up in the top here, and all the microphone and everything are up there. I, my antenna plugs in from the side, and I'm ready to go. So I don't need to tear anything apart. So less than two minutes, I can have everything running. 
So there's a lot of information on Go boxes. So this is an example of a Class B operation with a vehicle for the power, a Go box sitting on the back deck here, and a nice little mast here with two antennas on it. Some suggestions. I've operated Class B from a number of different places over the years, so I put together a lot of information on Class B operations. Some of the hints that I suggest um, include extra connectors and adapters, both coax, power poles, etc., and a means to install new connectors if you break one off. I know that many of us use Anderson power poles. I've been using them for over 30 years, and uh, they're great unless you happen to yank one off the end. So I always make sure I have extras in my case that I can cr and a crimper so I can put new ones on the end. Have some tools to make repairs, assemble antennas, etc. One of the most important things, if you're going out and operating Class B, or if you're doing a SOTA operation or a POTA operation, I always make sure I have two antennas with me. I may not set up both antennas, but I always make sure I have two antennas. Because one year I went out with an antenna and I got in the field and the connector broke off the end of it. And it was done. That was it. There was no way to use this antenna because it had an integrated antenna connector on it. So. I always make sure I have at least one backup antenna or two. And I usually, for field day, set up multiple antennas because you'll see I operate multiple stations at the same time. But don't rely on just one antenna. If nothing else, just throw a long wire antenna or a dipole into your bag and carry it with you so in case the other antenna plans fall through, you'll have a backup. I have a link here on picking a field operating position. Um, I also do a lot of backup a lot of prepare, preparation for computer software. I have a backup USB drive in my Go box that has my logging program installation on it, WSJTX installation on it, drivers and firmware for my radios, sound cards, etc. PDF copies of all my manuals for my radio equipment that I have, uh, spare USB CAT cables, etc. Uh, I have a USB GPS receiver so I can time sync and for FT8 and FT4. It's not a problem for field day, but uh, we've stayed in Delaware a couple years ago. And um, after field day, we, we stayed for the rest of the week and operated to give people a chance to, to get Delaware on FT8 and FT4. And it was a cabin without uh, Wi-Fi. So after about two days, my computer got out of time sync. So I had to drive, drive about five miles to McDonald's, go through the drive through get a milkshake and resync my radio time uh, and I did that a couple times during the week. After I got home, I bought a GPS receiver, so I don't need to do that anymore, but I don't get milkshakes. So I'm not sure which is better, the milkshakes or the GPS receiver. Some other suggestions for Class B. Make a list to ensure that you have adequate personal hygiene items, uh, AC power accessories. Even though you might be operating on emergency power, you might need to charge things ahead of time or do some work on your computer, and you don't want to blow through your batteries while you're getting ready for field day. But if you're staying somewhere like we did at the one other cabin we stayed at, there was no power there anyway, so it didn't really matter. Bring your own small table and chair that you can sit in for 24 hours. There's nothing worse than not having a chair. When in doubt, put it in the car. So here's some operations that we did. Uh, my wife and I always travel. She doesn't operate. She comes along with me, but she doesn't operate. So we went out on the train. We did a train trip around the United States. So we went from Cleveland out to Montana and operated at East Glacier. And this was the view. This is the picnic table I was sitting around. But if I turned around, this is what was behind me. And the goat wasn't there, but I was just surprised at how many goats were in the park everywhere I turned around. So this is uh, 2009. That's when, the year I got this shirt that I'm wearing today. So this is my souvenir shirt from that year. I also operated from Acadia National Park in Maine. Uh, and this was the first spot in the U.S. to have sunlight hit them on field day morning because of the, it wasn't the furthest east site, but it was the combination of being east and up high. I was the first person to get sunlight. And this was the only time I didn't bring a chair with me. I actually sat on one rock and used the other rock for a, uh, a table. I had a, uh, a blanket folded up that I was sitting on. But it got so bright in the sunlight that I eventually had to take the blanket out from underneath me and cover, put it over top of me like a little tent so I could see the screen of the computer I was logging with. Uh, this was Cass, West Virginia. This was a cabin we stayed in with no electric uh, for a week and learned how to use uh, how to cook with the uh, wood stove and uh, operated from there. Also visited, visited the Cass Scenic Railroad, which was nearby. And these are other places, a yurt in West Virginia, um, we used my van for many years. The last three years, we actually towed it to the field day site 
because the engine had died on it. My club still used it for an operating position. Here's my uh, go box, and this is Hocking Hills in Ohio. And this was the last time I got a chance to go out in the field, and this is when I was uh, in in Vermont, and I was operating 2B uh, right-hand radios operating CW or or uh, single sideband, depending on what I was operating at the time. The left-hand radio is operating FT8. Uh, if you're if you have option if you're trying to operate from home and you have restrictions as far as a homeowners association, there's a number of stealthy antennas you could use, like an indoor antenna, a balcony or window antenna, flagpole antennas. If you're doing satellite contacts, you're holding a a handheld antenna, so that's not a problem. And for FT8 and FT4, I found that uh, you can that they're very good to use with these poor antennas. So if you are going to operate with a really poor antenna, I suggest you have FT8 and FT4 as one of your possible operating modes. Um, magnetic loop antennas are very good for portable operations, but one of the pains is every time you change frequency, they have a very narrow bandwidth and you end up having to retune it constantly. But if you're using it for FT8 or FT4, once you get it on the right band and tuned up, you don't need to change it all the time. So they're a great antenna for an FT4 or FT8 station. So if you're operating in a club setting, most of the time the technicians operate under a control operator who has a higher class license, so they can operate on all the bands and all the modes. But if they're operating from their home station, they have to only operate under their technician class license privileges. So that would include a VHF station, either using two meter single sideband or digital and digital, two meter FM simplex possibly, uh, which there isn't a lot of activity on field day, but it's still maybe some. Satellite contacts, uh, 10 meter single sideband and digital if 10 meters opens up. But there also is CW capability. If this person has CW capability, you can operate on 80, 40, 10, uh, 80, 40, 15, and 10 uh, CW. So that is a place to make contacts, and there'll be a lot of people available uh, during field day. Um, I actually put together another presentation I did in January for this group called Technician Life Beyond Repeaters, and uh, you can you view that whole presentation for a lot of information on operating under a technician class license. I mentioned six meters for technicians. Uh, limited range unless eSkip is present. Well, the last couple of days, eSkip has been really present. I've been working Europeans on FT8 on six meters and uh, it's been great so if we have a weekend like the last two days you could have a couple hundred six meter contacts very easily i would strongly suggest that in addition to phone on sing on six meters you also have ft8 and ft4 have both of them and your chances are much greater of making more contacts uh two meters uh simplex um not a lot of activity but there is some depending on how how many people are in your area. Satellite operation, again, if you're planning on doing satellite operation, don't wait until field day to learn how to do it. Start practicing now. It can be very frustrating if you've never done it before. But it's an easy, inexpensive way. If you get an antenna and put that with a dual band handheld, you could actually operate some of the low Earth orbiting FM satellites. And I have a whole section in my, techno in my technician life beyond repeaters on satellite operation. And I uh, also wrote a little paper on satellite operation. And uh, 10 meters, again, if the band opens up, and it did open up with eSkip this, these last couple of days, so it was very promising. The CW section I talked about earlier. And I have a whole presentation on uh, CW called Having Fun with Morris Code. And it's you can read through that. And even if you're not a really great CW operator, you can still make contact CW uh contacts. It's not the same as rag chewing for ours because all you need to do is get the station's call sign and their exchange. So it's a much simpler uh, CW operation than rag chewing for ours. So let's say you are going to have a lot of your club members uh, soloing on their own. Some suggestions uh, include training on field day operation, um, help one-on-one, -on -one, including screen sharing. Last year before field day, I spent days and days uh, using uh, Chrome Remote Desktop to set up N1MM for club members so they'd be ready to operate uh, their logging software. 
we actually made a how-to video on that. It's available in my uh, video presentations at uh, tiny.cc slash kzt-p, and I'll actually give that at the end of my presentation here. But I have a whole section on using logging software. And coming up, I'll, I'll mention it in a moment here. We'll, I'll get to that in one second. So uh, information on field day, uh, contesting information, digital operation. I have resources on all of those. I also put together uh, what I call a simplified field day in FAQ uh, that has just a condensed version of the rules from the AWRL site. And actually, I, in some cases, I added a little bit more explanation for people that weren't accustomed to using it. So for example, I have a section here talking about if you're in Ohio, your exchange is going to be OH because I'm in Ohio, all my club members in Ohio. So don't no need to confuse them. So again, that's available to you also. I also wrote a, put together a letter that you can use with your club uh, to explain to club members how your club is going to do field day this year and talk about the aggregated scoring aspect. Our club also put together uh, some incentives last year. We had uh, a two prize drawing after the field day. Anyone that submitted their log and we saw it show up on the AWRL site, you were entered in a drawing for a $50 gift certificate from a local amateur radio store. And uh, we did that. We also asked people to take uh, pictures and we put together a slide presentation for our, our uh, meeting the, the month after field day. And each of the people that submitted an a entry were able to do pr a presentation on their individual field day. Oh, um, I strongly suggest you use the online scoreboard so people can see how other club members are doing. And there's information on these in my presentation and uh, on, the, on the large number of slides that I have out there and in my contesting section. But you can basically go to these live scoreboards and see the scores. And all it takes is a couple quick settings in your logging software and you don't have to do anything else. It pushes the information up automatically. So some of the specific needs, when we asked club members what they needed, a lot of people needed both help installing the software and how to use it. They really didn't understand basic contest operating style, so we trained them in that. We also talked a little bit about specifics of field day, and we designated uh, a phone online support person who was available before field day, the whole week before field day, and on field day day, they knew the people that they could call. There was one software support person and one radio support person. So if they had problems, they could dial one of those people up and they would help them uh, get back up and running. And it was the same people that were usually doing the same thing at field day site when we were together as a group. So you need to log your contacts. And for a very small operation, you could do it on a paper log. But even for a modest operation, if you want to get the most out of your operation, I suggest you use computer software for logging your contacts. And uh, if you're going to use computer logging, you might as well add a computer interface to your radio so it automatically records which band you're on and what the frequency is. Uh, N1MM Logger is a free logging software that's the most popular out there. And it supports field day along with most other contests. Uh, Rat Pack is going to be having a program. Actually, this is one night we changed. The, it's going to be Wednesday, June 9th uh, at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And, and your normal time that you attend Rat Pack programs, we're going to devote a whole program to setting up and uh, installing, setting up, using and using N1MM logger. So if you have club members that need to know about this, make sure they know about the Rat Pack meeting on June 9th. Uh, another piece of software that you can use for field day logging is the N3FJP software. It works very well. It's not very expensive. The field day version is very inexpensive, and it works very well also. But we're going to talk about N1MM for that meeting because it is free and a lot of people use it. So scoring in field day, uh, basically, each QSO is worth a different number of points depending on the mode you make it with. Phone contacts are, count as one point, CW contacts count as two points, and digital contacts count as two points each. So you take the total number of points you work, and then you multiply it by your power multiplier. So if you use five watts or less, 
and a non-commercial source, uh, batteries, solar power, etc., you get to multiply your score by five, which can be rather significant. If you use five watts or less and the power source is commercial or a motor-driven generator, you multiply by two. If all your contacts are made with an output power of up to 150 watts or less, you multiply by two. So you see, you don't get the advantage of the five watts unless you're using emergency power, a non-commercial, non-motor-driven power. And by the way, the power is determined by the the highest amount of power you use on any mode or any band during the contest. So if you make one contact with 100 watts and 999 contacts with 5 watts, your multiplier is still 2. So you have to make all your contacts with 5 or less watts. So in addition to the multiplying the scores, you then add your bonus points. All stations are eligible for bonus points, but certain points are only available depending on your class of entry. So, for example, uh, the Class A station get, bo get bonus points for an educational booth at the station, but a Class uh, B station can't do get those same points. Bonus points are added to the score after the multiply is applier is applied to determine the final score. Bonus points will be applied only when the claim is made on a summary sheet and proof, if required, accompanies the entry. So these are all of the bonus points that are available. And this little chart shows you which ones are available by each different class. So 100% emergency power is available to all classes of, except D, which means you're using commercial power so that wouldn't be available. Media publicity is available for all classes. Public location, though, is only available for an A, B, or F station. Uh, so you notice that there's different points available for different things. It is important that all clubs still strive to take part in the following bonus points categories. M media publicity. Uh, talk about am how amateur radio is functioning under social distancing and the continuity of field day over the years. Get articles out to your local newspaper, your local television station, radio station, etc. Uh, use social media publicity. Encourage site visitation by an elected official. Um, resources for public information table and educational table available for Class A stations. I have put together resources that you can click and print out, and then you can laminate these so you don't have to have paper to hand out, and people can simply shoot the QR codes with their phone to get all the information. And uh, I have a presentation on... Let's see, let me go back here. I have a presentation on uh, what is amateur radio, another one on uh, youth resources. I have a youth activity if you want to have them build a closed pin key out of uh, some materials. And I have information on using online shortwave, uh, online software defined radios. So again, these are all resources that you can use not only for field day, but anytime you're doing public, ev public events. Once you're all done, you need to use the submission tool and the submission tool uh, will allow you to choose the station, I'm sorry, the club that you want to submit your points to. So when you go to the entry form, you'll fill all this out. And then it's very important that when you pick the group name, use the drop down. Now, the drop down will contain all the stations that submitted logs, all the clubs that submitted stations last year. If your station is not there, you can add it by typing it in. But it's very important to tell your club members, if you were there from last year, check the list. See if you're in the list and make sure they use the right one. So I'm in the Cuyahoga Falls Amateur Radio Club. So it's under CU. So right here, I'd make sure that all my club members chose that for my club. Matter of fact, you can just tell all your club members to submit your points to this score, to Cuyahoga Falls Amateur Radio Club. Is that okay with everyone? You don't want it for your club. Submit them to mine. Okay. Just joking. Now, Again, everyone uses their own call sign for their station, and then they can submit their scores. Uh, Paul uh, N1SFE is going to be doing a presentation uh, for the uh, AWRL learning uh, webinars. I think it's June 10th. I can't remember the date for sure, but if you check on the AWRL website, he's going to be doing a field day presentation coming up for the learning uh, lab for the learning project webinars. 
So let's say you have a lot of people that are interested in operating field day and they say, well, you know, I don't really operate contests that much, so I don't, I'm not really sure on how to do everything. Well, there's a couple of great activities coming up where you can either work as a club or you can have individuals do it and they can uh, practice some of the things. So if you're interested in operating six meters or two meters or eight FT8 or FT4, the AWRL June VHF contest is a great time to do that. And it's also a great time to set up portable antennas in the field. So uh, that's coming up in June. Uh, the phone fray is an activity that occurs every week on Tuesday evenings. Um, actually, it's Wednesday morning uh, in other part uh, UTC, but it's Tuesday evenings local time. And that's a great place to try out your single sideband operating contest skills. The CW Ops have three contests every Wednesday, one at nine in the morning, three in the afternoon, at nine in the evening, um, where you can practice uh, contest style CW operations. There's also a slow net and CW sponsored by K1USN, and that's on Sunday nights, although they may have moved it to Fridays. I'm, I'm not sure on that, I have to double check to make sure. And for some reason, I just popped out of my presentation. Let's get back in there. If you don't want to use any of those activities, your club can do its own activities, such as a simplex net or a two meter uh, simplex net. We started an activity called the club, the band expiration net. We used to have a 10 meter net every Monday but evening, but now what we do is we have 10 meters on the first Monday of the month, uh, 40 meters on the second Monday of the month, I'm sorry, six meters on the first Monday, 10 meters on the second Monday, 40 meters on the third Monday, and 80 meters on the fourth Monday. And then if there's a fifth Monday during the wintertime, we have it on 160. During the summertime, we have it on one of the work bands so that people get a chance to try out different antennas and make sure that everything's working. If you're not, if you're new to FT8, I have a whole presentation on FT8 and FT4. If you're interested in trying out portable antennas, do a parks on the air, or summit on the air activity, that's a great place to try your go box out, try your portable power out, and try your antenna. So it's a great shakedown for field day. Uh, make sure you add your station to the field day locator. Click on this link and you can go out and you can simply add your station to the locator. I, this is me right here, I think. Let's see. Nope, that's not me. I haven't put mine on there yet. I'm going to be in West Virginia this year. Um, so maximizing your 2021 field day experience. Learn something new. Record your videos. Record videos and take photos to share with future club meetings. Have an inter-club competition. If you're connected to the internet, make sure you use the real-time online scoreboards. And this is information on those. Write up an article for your local club's newsletter. Create materials for local media coverage. Live stream your operation to share with local government officials if they can't attend in person. Be prepared for any future emergencies. Some of the takeaways from Field Day 2021. Uh, it brought out many of the underlying aspects of the whole field day or an image in the mindset of your amateur radio club members, including what participating in field day has meant in the past and what participating in field day uh, in the future could be like. If you enjoy the competitive aspects of field day, uh, consider getting into contest and trying out some other contest. If you like the emergency preparedness aspect, Consider getting involved in MCOM activities available throughout the year in your area. Don't just think of field day as the only time of year you do these things. If you like the community outreach and educational aspect, think about uh, teaching a class in amateur radio, or working with local youth or schools, setting up and maintaining an active public relations program in your area, including press media, uh, press media and social media. And if you like all three aspects of field day, uh, get, get involved in all of them. So the, I put together one slide here that has all the resources that I put together for field day. I already showed you the portable antennas. I also put together two cheat sheets for you to use on the AWRL and uh, Radio Canada sections. This one is sorted by number order so that you, when you, you hear these numbers, 
you can uh, look for the abbreviation based on what they're telling you that the location is. And then the other one is a alphabetical order listing based on each of the sections. Also has a little section on common Q symbols and phonetic alphabet. The resources I mentioned before for, I got to fix that link. That's a bad link. We'll fix that. The, the, what is amateur radio? The, the uh, resources for youth handout that you can have and so forth. And again, all the resources are available at tiny.cc slash FDSD. Um, all my presentations that I've done over the last year plus are available at tinycc slash k8zt-p. And I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and take questions. So um, some of the questions, what links, will the links for the first presentation be available in Rat Pack tomorrow? Yes, they will. But again, this is the main one you need. I'm going to put it in the chat. It's the one for the slideshow. Just click on that to make sure it works. Good. So there's the link in this in the in the uh, chat. So other questions, comments, complaints, planned field day activities, suggestions. Maybe tell us a little bit what, what your club's planning for field day. How many people are doing a traditional field day? How many people are doing individual operators? Uh, my club's doing uh, traditional. We think we're open enough to do it that way. Are you going to be doing the same size operation? Uh, we're kind of expecting maybe 20% less people. Okay. So you're, you're, you're going to be working from Utah. Right. We have a, a site up in the national forest. Uh, we camp out for the weekend and set up there. What, what, what category, what, what number are you using? How many? Um, are you I, think with the, I think with the GOTA, we were a four, okay. or maybe GOTA doesn't count. Go, uh, yeah, GOTA does not count. And if you are an A station, adding a go, GOTA station is a free station, and you can also add a VHF, UHF station for a free station. Other clubs, groups, questions, comments? I'm going to be joining a new group out in the Nebraska Panhandle this year. And uh, I'm hoping to get everything put in place. Uh, we're going to a state recreation area that's going to be a really popular location. I just hope to get all the stuff ready to go by then. Good. Anyone else? Is anyone going to be operating on their own this year? Yeah. Uh, Mike and Key Club and the Seattle area will be doing individual operations, although a lot of those will be various uh, members getting together in smaller groups or going to each other's sites. It was mostly because we have a, a traditional annual spot at one of our state parks uh, with a group camp and uh, uh, a barracks and a special setup, and we couldn't be guaranteed of getting all three of those in time. Uh, so we decided to go the same route as last year. Yeah, my local club is doing a, probably going to do a two station setup as opposed to a typical four or five station setup. And uh, the rest of the people will be doing individual groups. I was very pleased last year. We had 22 club members submit individual operations, which is 
a lot more than we usually have operators at our group operations. So uh, we got a lot of people on there for the first time on their own from home. Yeah. Well, Martin in uh, River City, uh, Sacramento. He's he's uh, he's going to be doing a hybrid. Looks like. I will be 2B West Virginia. My wife and I have a little uh, chalet. My wife and I always use field day as our vacation. We weren't able to do it last year, but we try and go to a state that has less than 15 uh, people operating, uh, stations usually operating. And so we've done West Virginia, Vermont, Delaware, Montana, and Maine. Wow. Anybody else got any comments out there? They're saving their voice for field day. I guess they are. Suggestions? Well, Anthony, go ahead. Anthony, yes. Since you haven't heard it this last week, you are a national resource. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're becoming a resource for a lot of people for a lot of things, Anthony. Make sure you tell anyone that's interested in the N1MM software, even if they're not going to be operating field day on their own, to, to uh, put June 6th on their schedule and get the software installed before that so we can uh, help them with any issues they might have. Yes. I keep muting myself so that I don't cough in your guys' ears. Well, uh, is there anything else here, folks? I'll uh, Ethel, make sure I get this slide uh, show he did here so we can uh, get it up on the out the email everybody to see it and the video to see it. So uh, all the normal stuff will be present. Actually, I'll put it up. I'll put it up as soon as I'm done tonight. So the slideshow, not the video, but the slideshow, will be up tonight. Okay. Cool. I just and if, if you haven't already signed up, you can still sign up. By the way, for the uh, Hamvention forms coming up tomorrow, and uh, the four days in May registration is already closed, so you can't do that. But you can do the uh, the Hamvention. Uh, contest on Sunday. Anthony, thanks for all you do for us. Oh, you're very stuff. welcome. Very I enjoyed it. A lot of good information. I, I just feel weird that I'm not packed up and headed to, to, I would have been in Dayton yesterday, actually, last night. Well, there's a lot of people who feel like you do right now. And it's beautiful weather in Ohio, believe it or not, this week, this week so far. No snow this week. <laughs> and the cicadas are not out yet. Well, it is now the top of the hour. And uh, anybody else got any comments out there? Suggestions? Answers? Complaints? Yes, complaints. Hi, Dan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Barry. Well, I drove all the way up to Stewart. There's no one there. Hey, welcome to my world. They didn't have a club meeting today. It said right in the that said right in their email that it was supposed to be tonight, on the twentieth. No one was there. So I came all the way back. What a waste. <laughs> well, look at the scenery you got to see. Yeah. Well, folks, rather than just drag this out, um, I will close it out. We'll leave it open afterwards. You want to check back in, just visit with each other. Anthony, once again, I thank you for everything you've done. Great presentation. And uh, we'll go out there. Get the rest of it done out there. And you see you're going to, you're going to post the deal yourself, so we'll, I won't worry about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll post the links. You'll need to post the video, of course, but I'll post the links. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. And I'll fix this bro the one broken link. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, 73 is everyone. 73 is, and thank you, Anthony. Oh, you're welcome. Good night. 73, everyone. Thanks a lot. Good night.